Hi everyone, we're gonna be looking at the respiratory system and its diseases and disorders today, but first we need to go ahead and do a review of the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. So when we look at the anatomy and physiology, remember that this system consists of your chest because there's muscles in that area that are going to help you with breathing as well as your lungs, and then the conducting airways. These conducting airways include your nasal cavity here, your mouth, your pharynx, which is your throat, your larynx, and then also then the trachea and on down into the bronchioles. Now there's kind of two parts when we look at it anatomically with your system. We have the upper rep respiratory system. This consists of your nose, mouth, your sinus cavities, which are going to be in these type of areas as well as your pharynx and your larynx. So anything above this point where your voice box is, is going to be considered the upper respiratory system. The lower respiratory system consists of the trachea, the bronchii, and the bronchioles. So moving on down into the lungs. Now in the lungs, there are some special structures called the alveoli. These are at the very distant end of those little bronchioles. They're the, we call those the terminal bronchioles because they come to an end. It's like a dead end. At those areas, these alveoli look like clusters of grapes in a sense, but they're gonna act a little more like balloons where they're going to inflate when you breathe in, okay? Allowing then, because they are wrapped around with blood vessels, specifically those capillaries, and they're gonna allow the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, this exchange does happen just with normal diffusion, so oxygen's gonna move from high concentration from the lungs to low concentration into the blood and carbon dioxide is going to move the opposite way. Now inhalation and exhalation is the actual movement of the air in and out of your lungs. So we have a couple of pictures here. You can see here that you have your upper respiratory um, tract, which we're gonna be above the larynx. In a minute, when we start talking about some infections, when they're called upper respiratory tract infections, they're gonna be kind of up in your head. We would call those a lot of times head colds in a sense. If something gets down into the lower respiratory tract though, it's gonna be a little harder to treat because it's getting deeper into the body and it is gonna be more difficult. You can also see in this picture that you have your actual um, chest cavity with the rib cage coming around. Those are going to have muscles that are gonna help with breathing, as well as the diaphragm, which is the muscle that separates the, the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So this is showing you though the upper and lower together. Now, we also have functionally two systems that are taking place here, or two kind of processes. One is the conducting zones. The conducting zones are all of the structures that are going to bring the air into the lungs or out of the lungs. They are going to be conducting the air. They also moisten it as well as warm it before it hits your lungs. Then you have actually where the respiratory part of the function comes in. This respiratory zone is the actual site of the gas exchange, where they're exchanging the carbon dioxide and the oxygen, and that's gonna happen at the alveoli. All right, so this is showing you mostly the lower respiratory tract. We have the larynx there, but you can see the trachea, the bronchioles, and then the lungs. Okay, so this is the lower respiratory tract. You can know that this looks kind of like a, they call it the bronchial tree, because if you were to turn this upside down, you would see that the trachea would be like the trunk and the bronchioles would be like branches. If we take a closer look, okay, into the actual lung structure, you can find the alveoli, which are here. We can see that there's going to be the alveolar ducts, which conduct into the alveolus or alveolar sac. And then you can also see that there are blood vessels or the capillaries wrapped around these structures. Now the reason we want them close, the capillaries and the alveoli, is because the closer they are together, the less distance that gas has to move. The less distance, the better it's going to move. If that gets where it's a bigger gap, then we see diffusion's gonna be harder to do. And in some of the disorders we're gonna talk about in a little bit, that actually happens, where those two structures are no longer close together, whether it's fluid in the middle, if it's infection, is it swelling, something is causing there for that to be separated, it's going to ultimately affect the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now let's talk a little bit about how you breathe in and how you breathe out. Now when you breathe in, this is known as inspiration. Inspiration is when the pressure inside of your lungs is less than the pressure outside of your body. So this causes air to want to move from high pressure to low pressure and it's drawn into your lungs. 
Now there's a couple of things that have to contract in order for this to happen as well. The diaphragm, that dome-shaped muscle is gonna contract. This is gonna open up more space in your chest cavity, allowing the air to be drawn in, as well as the external intercoastal muscles that are going to be uh, connected to the rib cage. They are going to allow you to expand your chest. So when you take a really deep breath in, you can see that the chest actually expands. Now, if we wanna force more air in, we can use additional muscles for help. These additional muscles are like the sternocleidomastoid, which runs right here. So when you take a real deep breath, you can see that in your neck, okay, where you're using all of that. We also see that you can use the scalenes. The scalenes, remember, are the ones, are the muscles on the ribs that look like a serrated knife, okay, where they have the little projections as well as the pectoralis minor. The pectoralis minor in the chest can also help with breathing. And when we talk about breathing, it's the forcefully inhaling more air than what you need. It's kind of like when you would, before you would jump into a pool. Now, when we breathe out, this is called expiration. Expiration is where the pressure inside of your lungs is greater than the pressure outside. And so the air is gonna be forcefully pushed out. This is where the diaphragm is gonna relax. So it was constricted and now it's gonna relax and be domed again, and that's gonna force the air out. We also see that we're going to contract the internal intercoastals that are between your ribs, and that's going to help pull the chest cavity down. Okay, so like when you have forceful air coming out, you can see that the chest actually kind of goes in, it deflates in a sense. Now we can force more out, air out by using our abdominal muscles. That's why if you were to get hit in the gut or the in the stomach, a lot of times we talk about, oh, I got the air knocked out of me. It's because that forcefully pushes more air out. Okay, using those abdominal muscles. Now guys, all of this is controlled. Okay, when we look at the rate of how you're breathing and also these muscle contractions, they're all controlled by a certain area in your brain, which is the medulla. The medulla oblongata has a vital center, it's part of your brain stem, and it is going to help control your breathing. So let's look at some common signs and symptoms with somebody who has issues with the respiratory system. Well, a lot of times they have what we call dyspenia. Dyspenia is difficulty breathing. Their breathing is very labored. It's hard for them to get that air moving in and out. Another one is the orthopenia. This is going to be shortness of breath, specifically when you are laying supine or flat. Individuals who have this cannot lay flat, and so they need to lay it like an incline, like in a recline or prop some pillows up. They cannot lay flat. We also have apnea. Apnea is when you stop breathing. It's a cessation of breathing. We normally see this when we call it sleep apnea. And this, cause, this is happening where you quit breathing while you're asleep. A lot of times too with respiratory illnesses, we have wheezing. This wheezing, because they're having difficulty getting that air in and out, causes hypoxemia. This is gonna be where there's less oxygen in the actual blood. If the blood is not able to transport oxygen like it should, your tissues will start to experience what we call cyanosis. Cyanosis means they're not getting enough oxygen and they start to turn blue. We'll notice this bluing to happen around the lips, sometimes the nose, but also in the beds of their fingernails. Okay, we'll notice that those tissues start to turn blue. Sneezing and coughing can also be common signs and symptom, uh, common sign and symptom for the, um, for respiratory issues, as well as nasal discharge. So what are some diagnostic tests that we can do when we're looking at the respiratory system? Well, just like with the heart, listening is gonna be super important. So these auscultations is gonna be important when we listen to breathing. So a lot of times when the doctor is listening to your heart, they're also gonna move off to the side and start listening to your lungs as well as in the back. What they're doing is they're listening to the lungs and looking at your breathing quality as well as your rate. They're looking to see if the rate becomes more rapid, and we call that tachypnea. Or if there's crackle or rails that they hear, these are known as musical sounds and they're heard when you breathe in. So it's kind of like this crackling that takes place. We also see that there could be ronchi. Ronchi is a rattling sound in the bronchi and it's due to normally some sort of obstruction that's there. Now this could be a physical obstruction in the sense of like something in that you inhaled and is blocking, but it could also be like mucus. It could be due to inflammation, but something is causing an obstruction. We also then see that chest x-rays could be used. Chest x-rays are going to help look for tumors. They can help us diagnose tuberculosis or TB. We can also see abscesses and pneumonia through X chest x-rays. Another are sputum cultures. This is where we would ask them to cough and we would collect their sputum. This is to help ID infectious type agents. 
Tissue biopsies may also need to be done. This is normally done with a fine needle, and it's normally going to be done with the next one, which is the bronchioscopy. Now, here in the picture, they're showing you the bronchioscopy is going to be a camera they're going to put in, and they're going to they're going to go down and look through like the trachea and the bronchi, and making sure that they're open and allowing air to flow through. Now, if they do find something that's an obstruction or something that's not supposed to be there, they could take a biopsy of it. We also see that we can check your arterial blood gases. These are going to measure the amount of oxygen that's found in your blood. Now, since this is the arterial blood gases, you're gonna have to get the blood from an artery, not a vein. This will give us a good idea of how much oxygen the blood's able to carry. And then of course, we can also do a pulmonary function test. When we do a pulmonary function test, we're gonna look at your lung capacity. We're gonna look at how well your lungs are able to function, how well you can breathe in, how well, well you can breathe out. And the whole thing there is also forcefully breathing in and forcefully breathing out. Lots of different kind of technology can be used. And a lot of times pulmonary function tests are gonna be done by respiratory therapists. And a machine a lot of times that they'll use is called a spirometer. All right, so let's look at some diseases of the upper respiratory tract. When we look at the upper respiratory tract, smoking is the number one risk behavior, like risk factor for developing chronic respiratory disease. If an individual will stop smoking, this will decrease their chances of developing those diseases by a huge amount. Okay, so smoking is the number one risk factor. Now, upper respiratory tract infections are known as URIs. Do not get these confused with UTIs. UTIs are urinary tract infections, so there is a difference here. We see that upper respiratory tract infections are usually acute illnesses, meaning they come on pretty quickly, but they don't last very long. Your body is able to kind of fight it off pretty quickly. And this is most commonly caused by rhinoviruses. Now rhinoviruses like to infect here in the nose first, and then they can ultimately spread. A lot of times, like I said, we call these head colds or even just like a common cold. Now, what are some risk factors that come into play when we talk about an upper respiratory tract infection or a URI? We have things like congestion, runny nose, sore throat, sneezing, coughing, fever, headaches, and those aches, kind of those body aches. And so if you'll notice, those are a lot of the th same things we talk about with the cold or even the flu. Now, what are the treatments when we talk about URIs? So when we're talking about upper respiratory infections, we see treatment mostly as rest because a lot of these are gonna be caused by viruses. And if that's the case, we cannot treat them with antibiotics. So we're going to have to support the body in their fight. So we wanna rest, we wanna provide fluids. We may need to provide antipyretics, which are fever reducers, as well as analgesics with some of those painkillers, especially sometimes even anti-inflammatories if you've got a lot of inflammation that's happening, okay, especially in your sinuses. Now, antibiotics may be prescribed if you have also a secondary bacterial infection. So that's key. So sometimes you end up getting like this really bad cold or the flu, but then you'll also get like strep throat. The strep throat is a secondary bacterial infection, which could be treated with antibiotics, but the actual cold or flu could not because it's a viral. Now, one of the main preventions when we're talking about a lot of the respiratory system disorders or diseases is regular hand washing. Okay, if we will wash our hands and also cover our mouth when we sneeze or cough, that can actually help reduce and cause and be more preventative when we talk about a lot of these infections. Now, the diseases of the upper respiratory tract could also be kind of put into other categories, like more specific, and ones like the common cold. This is acute rhinitis, so we see that it's inflammation in the nasal cavity that takes place. There are several hundred viral strands of rhinitis that can cause different types of common colds. We also have hay fever. Hay fever is an allergic rhinitis. Now, this means that it's not gonna be caused by a virus. This is something that got in there and irritated the mucous membranes. This is something you're allergic to. And hay fever, a lot of times, we also refer to as like seasonal allergies. This is gonna be where you breathed in dust or pollen or something that irritated you and then gave you those symptoms because it was an irritation, but it was due to an allergic reaction. We also see when we look at sinusitis, this is gonna be inflammation of the sinuses, particularly here or here in the forehead. The main symptom that we see with this is gonna be pain, and especially pain with headaches. We call them sinus headaches, okay? And it's due to all the pressure that builds up here and here. And a lot of times they'll feel it right in here as their head will throb and ache. And it is due to inflammation. 
We then have pharyngitis. Pharyngitis is a sore throat. Okay, so the sore throat could be due to a bacterial infection. It could be due to a viral infection. And you can see the redness here at the back of the throat. And then laryngitis is inflammation of the larynx, which is your voice box. This can actually cause inflammation on your vocal cords to where the main symptom is going to be where you are hoarse. You're not able to utilize those vocal cords like normal, and so it causes this hoarseness to take place. All right, so this kind of finishes up part one. If you have any questions or concerns, please let me know.